I'm going to bring you a word this morning. But first, first what I want to do is, it was, uh, it was Anzac Day yesterday, wasn't it? Many people make it to a service, a dawn service, a few. Okay. Um, I've, Joe and I have been really moved by this more and more as we kind of find out more and more information about the Anzacs. And, um, you know, this morning I felt to speak about the battle. And God placed it on my heart during this week. But what, I'm, what we're going to do is Joe's going to read a thing called the Spirit of, of Anzac. And um, because there's, there's, something, there's something about what took place 100 years ago with men and women in this nation and the spirit that, that has so many likenesses to what God is doing in the church right now, what he's asking the church to rise up in. And I'm not talking about a battle physically and that we need to wage war physically. I'm not talking about anything like that, so please don't hear that. But what I am talking about is something that was in the heart of men and women a hundred years ago that I go the church we need to wake up we need a, rea- a reality check of what it is we're called to have we've got the spirit of the living God within us that what motivated men and women without and with the spirit of God a hundred years ago how much more so for us with the Spirit of God. I better not start because I'll keep on going and my wife will never get to read this thing. You can actually keep playing while she reads this out. That'd be fantastic. The Spirit of Anzac was suggested by official war historian C.E.W. Bean to have stood and still stands for reckless valour in a good cause, for enterprise, resourcefulness, fidelity, comradeship and endurance that will never own defeat. The Spirit was epitomised in the deeds of Simpson with his donkey at Gallipoli. Comradeship, courage and sacrifice others before self. It also encompasses the laughter, the pride and the love of life that is in every Australian. To really understand this spirit, one must delve back into our country's past. Australia is a huge land. In the early days, settlements were scarce and far apart, yet pioneers built our society's foundations in these fragmented, tiny communities. The sun and the open land, the independence and the freedom of living under these conditions was a flame in the blood of our pioneers, a flame that burns whenever men are free, wherever there is a spirit which is willing to help those in need. If there were rumours of trouble, immediately someone would saddle a horse and ride off to see if they could help. Though on a comparatively smaller scale, our New Zealand neighbours in this Antipodean part of the British Empire also emerged with a very similar culture. Conflicts were not unknown to this part of the world. The Eureka Stockade Troubles of 1854 in Victoria, the Shearer's Strike of 1890 in Queensland and the subsequent Eastern Seaboard Maritime Strikes were but a few homegrown examples. New Zealand's Maori Wars in the early 1860s saw volunteers from the separate colonies of Australia assisting their Kiwi mates to establish independence in another developing country country. Again in 1885 the colonies displayed passionate outrage and a willingness to avenge the brutal death of Britain's General Gordon at Khartoum despite only a New South Wales contingent being accepted for service. And when the Boer War erupted in South Africa's volunteer units from the colonies competed for a place beside the mother country's warriors. Thus, although the disparate colonies of our great land did not federate till 1901, 
Australians and New Zealanders had been united since the beginnings of their countries. And this unity, this love of life had formed the basis of the spirit of Anzac. The mother countries in a spot of bother again was a typical observation when the Great War began in 1914. Might as well help her get this sorted out was the accustomed response to someone in need. For a century, the Antipodean survivors had been helping overcome nature's curses and supporting each other's causes. Now they were equally ready again to assist Britain, this time to overcome German militarism. This was the spirit which imbued the volunteers as they dashed off with seemingly gay abandon to the First World War and what was to begun the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps. These bold, laughing soldiers were a new, unknown factor of a very old empire. They seemed to be of one race, for all of them had something the same bearing and something the same look of humorous, swift decision described poet laureate John Macefield. But if the British thought they took a bit of getting used to, the enemy never got used to them. These colonials fought as, fought as they lived, bravely, openly, independently and without fear. They proved that their young countries could produce men equal to any in the world, perhaps the greatest fighting force this world has ever known, the Anzacs. On 25th of April 1915, a new world was born. A new side of man's character was revealed. The spirit of Anzac was kindled. It flared with a previously unknown, almost superhuman strength. There was a determination, a zest, a drive, which swept up from the beaches on Gallipoli Peninsula as the Anzacs thrust forward with their torch of freedom. As they fell, they threw those following the torch so their quest would maintain its momentum. That torch of freedom has continually been thrown from falling hands, has kindled in the catcher's soul a zeal and desire for both our individual liberty and our country's liberty. That desire has been handed down with the memory and burns as brightly as the flame which first kindled it. But the spirit of Anzac is not confined to the battlefield. It lives in the schools, on the sports field, in fact, all over these great countries of Australia and New Zealand. The sun invades our bodies and makes us mad, mad for freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom to live and think as you will. The spirit of Anzac is not something we can see, but a powerful, driving sensation that can only be felt. It is a feeling that burns and burns in the heart of every Australian and New Zealand countryman. A warm, tender, fiery, even melancholy ideal that nurtures intense patriotism in the innermost soul of every body. Many foundation Anzacs died, but their glorious challenge to catch the throne torch sounds loud and strong to all. Their goal was freedom for the land they loved. The spirit of Anzac is invincible. It is the flame that burns forevermore in the heart of every true Australian and New Zealander. Today we stand safe and free, clothed with all the privileges and rights of citizens in these great free countries. And all these things, liberty, security, opportunity, the privileges of citizenship, we owe to those men who fought, endured, suffered and died for us and for their country. Their deeds and sacrifices gave us the invincible, the intangible, the spirit of Anzac.
think it's so important to honour those who have paid a price for what we have today. You know, throughout history, the enemy, talking about Satan, uses man. And he'll use military, and he'll use politicians, he'll use anyone that is allowed to be deceived and falling into his hands. But as much as the enemy will use people, God uses people. God looks for men and women. Whether they whether they fully understand it or not, but he will use men and women to see his plans and purposes that, to be fulfilled. Because God is not a man that he shall lie. And that which he's spoken about, that which he's prophesied, he will see fulfilled. The prophetic words that he's spoken over this nation before the world wars are destined to be fulfilled. So when we see images like that and hear what Joe read, it's important to honour those who have paid a price. Whether you believe it was God's purpose or not, or whatever your belief is, the reality is that men and women fought for the freedom of this nation, that we can be in the position we are now, able to meet together on a Sunday to worship God, that there's a freedom of speech where you can go and share the gospel to men and women around us without fear of persecution. prophetic words over this nation will come to pass. But God is looking for men and women who will say, you know what? I am prepared to be a soldier. I'm prepared to be a part of that process, that plan, to be part of the army, the salvation army, if you will. Regardless of what it looks like, regardless of even what I think about it or even what I know about it. Just like in the World War I, where you had 13, 14, 15 year old kids signing up, lying about their age to get in because they thought this is an adventure. We don't know much about it. We don't know what it's going to look like, but it's an adventure. Fearless. Joyful excited because they thought you know what this is something we can get and be a part of this is for our freedom think about it 14 15 year olds they lied about their age so that they could fight There's a spiritual battle going on. Paul charges Timothy. First Timothy says, But as for you, O man of God, flee from all these things. Aim at and pursue righteousness, godliness, which is the loving fear of God and being Christ-like. Pursue faith, love, steadfastness, patience, and gentleness of heart. Then he says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life to which you were summoned and for which you confessed the good confession of faith before many witnesses. I'm going to blow my nose, Andy. Can you just mute that please? says, charge them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be liberal and generous of heart, ready to share with others. In this way, laying up for themselves the riches that will endure forever as a good foundation for the future, so that they may grasp that which is life indeed. 
Oh, Timothy, oh, Timothy, guard and keep the deposit entrusted to you. Turn away from the irreverent babble and godless chatter with the vain and empty and worldly phrases and the subs, subs, and the, I don't know what that says, and their contradictions in what is falsely called knowledge and spiritual illumination. Fight the good fight of faith. Pursue these things. And in doing so, you you store up riches in heaven. Jesus wasn't joking around with Peter when he said, Peter, on this rock, on this foundation, on this revelation about who you say that I am, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. He wasn't mucking around. This is what we're a part of. Isaiah 60 says see Isaiah 60 I think is so important for where we are right now because of the timings of God as the church gets brighter so the darkness will get darker we're in the hour now of of where do you stand where will you stand where will you be When the battle reaches its peak, where will you stand? Will you be one that volunteers yourself? Will you be one that will push past fear? Because fear is part of the enemy's strategy to incapacitate the church, to to restrict and disable the church. Fear is a weapon of control and manipulation that the enemy uses. And when I live a life of fear, I've taken myself out of the battle. I've sat myself on the sideline. I've hidden myself in a trench where I have no effect or little effect on the cause and the battle at hand. And Steph, it's amazing, Steph spoke about the same thing on Wednesday night, just gone, and God has got his finger on it. He says, fear, church, is no longer something we can live by. It's no no longer something we can just allow in our lives. It's no longer something we can just go, but it's okay, because fear, it's, it's part of my personality. We can't justify it any longer. Because we're all saying, we want to see this in the church. We want to see salvations. We want to see signs, wonders, miracles. We want to see the church being taken from one degree of glory to another. It's fantastic to have good music. It's fantastic to have a nice building. But those things aren't going to release heaven on earth. Those things aren't going to fill the chairs, the empty chairs next to you. There's a battle going on, not just for land in the natural, but for land in the heavenlies. There's a spiritual battle going on for destinies, for men and women and their destinies. Not only their eternal destination, but their, their, the rewards in what they're to live now as Christians. I don't know who was confronted by last week's message that Paul brought about the position in our hearts of eternal darkness whilst being in the kingdom of heaven. When we're not stewarding or being obedient with what God's called us to in doing good works, works of faith, not dead works. It's challenging. Because if we settle, if we settle for a position in heaven, that's it. I've got my, I've got my ticket. She'll be right on the night. And we're going to we're really going to miss out on what God actually prepared for us. 
Someone once said, I need more courage and boldness to reach the lost. I said, no, you don't. You don't need more courage and boldness because you're afraid. What you need is more love. See, when love overwhelms us and overcomes us, it lights a fire that no fear can put out. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. When love overtakes us, you can't help but give of yourself and give what you've got. Freely you've received, so freely give it. Isaiah 60 says, Arise, church, arise. AJ, arise. Luke, arise. Johnny, arise. Anthony, arise. VJ, Emma, arise. Arise, arise, arise. I, for me, I go, wake up. Arise, you think about it, you've been sleeping. Arise, it's time to wake up. Hey, it's a new day, wake up. Wake up, it's a new day. It's not a day like yesterday. It's not a day that you've been living in the past. It's time to think differently. It's time to live differently. It's time to speak differently. Why? Because nothing can hold you back. Nothing can hold you down. You're not just a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror in Christ. Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life. Shine. Shine, be radiant with the glory of the Lord. That means be seen. It means be seen, be heard. Let people see you. Let people hear you. Let your good works, your kind words, the truth, let the truth be heard. Our Australian culture We've got a lot of things right, but there's also a lot of things wrong in our culture where if you stand up and you say you've got the truth, well, look out, someone's going to come along and tall poppy syndrome you and chop your legs out and say, who do you think you are? If we give in to that culture, we're never going to reach anyone for God. And I know we've heard it said so many times, there was a guy, I can't remember his name, but he said, Go and preach the gospel, and if you have to, use words. That's true in part, but what he wasn't saying is go and preach the gospel and don't don't use words at all. He didn't say that. But there's got to be a preaching of the gospel that accompanies our life. Because if you wait for your life to be all perfect, if you wait to, for your life to live and look like Jesus, you're going to be waiting a long time before you reach anyone. It's okay to say, you know what, I'm doing my best. There's some things I'm working through, but this is the truth that I'm aiming for. This is the truth in which I build my life on. This is the foundation. And I'm, I'm unashamed about this being the truth, that not every road leads to Rome. heard it said so many times, oh yeah, yeah, Allah and Buddha and you know, ah, it's all the same thing, it's all the same God, it's all about just living well. Let's not stir the pot. It's good enough if I didn't care about their destination. It's good enough if I thought that's fine. I don't care where you're going to end up. Arise from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord. 
for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, look around. Behold, look around. Be discerning. Darkness shall cover the earth and dense darkness. But the Lord shall rise upon you, and his glory shall be seen on you. Be discerning. Wake up. Let your light shine. But the Lord shall rise upon you, and his glory shall be seen on you. As the church continues to get brighter with the glory of the Lord, so too the darkness gets darker. We've been called to arise and to shine, to wake up and stand up for all to see. The enemy's plan is to come into the church and deceive its members. To say, there's not a battle going on. It's not really a war going on. Because this is something that people say. I mean, look at your life. It's fine. Everything's fine. It's good. Just worry about what you, you know, if you're going to pay your bills or if you're happy and satisfied in your job. Just worry about those things. Because that's what really matters. Worry about whether you're getting welcomed or greeted at church. Worry about whether, you know, they're playing your song or the music's too loud or... You know, let's worry about those things that really matter. That's what the enemy says. Whether it was a good message or not, was it a good message or not? So many more things important. When you put it in perspective. I understand I'm a young man. I've got a lot to learn. One thing God is showing me is it's so important to hold things in perspective. Because how you view life will be how you live life. We've heard it, the saying, out of sight, out of mind. It's out of sight, out of mind. Can't see it. Not really happening. Yeah? That's what we think about human trafficking. It's out of sight, out of mind. I can't see it, so therefore it's not really happening in Australia. Australia has the fifth, I think it's the fifth, they're the fifth largest in human trafficking in the nation in the world. Australia? America is the second largest nation of human trafficking in the world. It's happening in our back door. Out of sight, out of mind. The Lord's saying, I'm going to open eyes. Fear blinds. Love opens. If I've agreed with fear in my life, it blinds me, it dulls me to the perception that God's trying to reveal to me to what's going, really going on. Because it's fear of, but if, if I know about that, then what am I going to do? I can't really do anything. It scares me. Will it require something of me? My finances, my time, I'm not sure. I, it just scares me. Because if it is happening, it warms if it's happening down the road I, 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 I will not know what to do therefore out of sight out of mind I, I'll agree with fear as opposed to agreeing with faith and allowing God's love to give me the solution play my part to seeing these problems sorted out
You know, you watch, you watch the DVDs of the Transformation series. Have you seen those Transformation series? Anyone's heard of those? Only a few? They're about revivals that have occurred in certain pockets in the world, certain townships. And most of them started from a few people praying in a home. Night and day. Not relenting. They see the state of their town or their city. It's like God's opened their eyes to see the spiritual battle that's going on in them going, this is not good enough. Why? Because this is my city. God's given me authority to do something about it. They don't give up after a few days or a few weeks or a few early mornings. They've persisted to the point where their towns are turned around. Pubs closing down. Policemen got nothing to do because the crime rate's just diminished. Churches are packed. Healing, signs, wonders, miracles. God's going to open eyes like he did to uh, Elijah's, Elisha's servant. Remember that story in Two Kings? No? Let me read it to you. When the king of Syria was warring against Israel after counseling his servants, he said, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Then the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you pass not such a place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent to the place of which Elisha told and warned him, and thus he protected and saved himself there repeatedly. Therefore the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. He called his servants and said, Will you show me who of us is for the king of Israel? One of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedchamber. He said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. And it was told him, He is in Dothan. So the Syrian king sent the horses, chariots, and a great army. They came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was around the city. Elijah's servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? What shall we do? I can see the problem and all I can see is fear. I'm afraid. What are we going to do? Pack your bags quick. Let's get out of here. Just pretend it's not there. Pretend the problem's not there and they'll leave. What shall we do? Elisha answered, Fear not. Fear not. For those with us are more than those with them. Then Elijah, Elisha prayed, Lord, I pray you, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Lord, open our eyes that we may see. That we may see your army what it is you're doing. So we know there's a battle going on. The Lord has positioned his armies for battle. They are waiting for us to partner with them. But before we can begin to take on large spiritual forces and deal with these different things, we need to deal with the internal state of mind. What's interesting is that the most common title given to God in Scripture is the Lord of Hosts, which literally means the Lord of Armies. 
And this is used more than 10 times as much as any other title given to him. Yeah, but he's such, he's just a loving God. You know, he's my dad. I just love him. You know, he's just so just gentle, isn't he? He's just, you know, I can just rest my head on him. And, you know, he's the big man. He's the G. He's, you know. He is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of the armies. He's the general. But we need to deal with the internal state of mind. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God, and fear is one of those things that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. But we have to cancel our agreement with fear. It's not enough to say, God, if you want me to not have the fear, then you'll just take it away. God says, but I've given you authority and you've agreed with fear and surrendered that authority. You need to cancel that agreement so that you can release the full authority that I gave you. We lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ. The Messiah, the Anointed One. Fear is a weapon in which the enemy uses to disable us and control us. Fear is a control mechanism. Fear will shape your life if you let it. If you let fear shape your life, it will. You ever had certain things seem to follow you around? Why does that always happen to me? Fear. Why do I always get like this when this happens? Fear. I love the imagery we get in the story, Numbers 13, where the Israelites send out the 12 spies for the land and they come back going 10 of them going no way we can't we can't possess the land my goodness the giants are too big ah freaking out fear only two said no no we can take them because God said we can but fear is a controlling manipulative weapon Fear is the opposite of faith. So instead of trusting God, we move by fear. Therefore, we don't actually activate the faith that we've got. Therefore, we don't possess and live and walk in what God says we can live and walk in. So we don't occupy the promised land and receive all that the promised land has for us. So we go on a journey for 40 years in the wilderness to learn what it is to trust God. That's what the journey was about. You didn't trust me with what I said, so now let's go on a journey. When it could have been shortcutted. I'll still love you and I'll still provide for you and your shoes won't wear out. But I can't use a generation that will continue to give in to fear to occupy the land that you need faith to occupy. Why? Because in Canaan, you had to, to rely on God just as when He sent Abraham to Canaan there was no river system that flowed through Canaan like there was in Egypt and the other place. <laughs> to live in Canaan, you had to trust God for the rain to water the earth. Canaan was a land of faith. 
the promise was faith. It wasn't until Joshua came along to lead the people. Joshua made, God made a point of saying, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Don't give in to what you've seen others give in to any longer. What's incredible about Joshua is where, where did he grow up? Where was he often left? In the tent of meeting. He was often left there in the presence of God to learn about the Almighty, the Lord of hosts. He learned about what it was to have a fear of God. But fear is bad. Fear of God's not bad. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, we're told. If we don't have a healthy, reverential fear of God, who He is and our desire to please Him, then we will leave ourselves vulnerable to the fear of the world, those things that the enemy uses to disempower us. The fear of God is the foundation we build our relationship with Him on. It keeps us from becoming familiar with Him. It helps us understand His Lordship. And that He is a caring, loving Father who wants the best for us and is always just and true. See, we won't fully understand His, His unconditional, passionate love for us if we don't have a healthy fear of Him. Not fear of punishment. Not fear that He's going to smack you if you get something wrong, but a fear that He is God Almighty. That God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, loves me unconditionally. Not an earthly father. Not one that I can treat familiar. Casual. Ah, she'll be right. Oh, I've got grace. That's not grace at all. Grace empowers me to do the thing that I could not do in my flesh. It even says, I've got a scripture here somewhere. Somewhere in here. Where is it? It's in the New Testament. <laughs> Where he says, I'll give you even more grace. Talking about overcoming the things of the world. I'll even give you more grace. And then you've got the story with Paul talking about the thorn in the flesh. Where he says, Lord, remove it from me. And he says, no, I won't. Why? Because my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul says, therefore, I will boast in my infirmities. I will boast in my weakness, in my frailty, in my carnality. Because as I do that, I know He'll be glorified even the more because I can't do it in my strength. He understood who His God was. When I have a healthy fear of God, I will not fear the world. I'll move in a humility which is a confidence in who He is that He may use me and release His power and authority through me to establish His kingdom on earth. If I don't have a healthy fear of God, then it leaves me vulnerable to what God, what the enemy is wanting to do. And that's to bring fear. Fear will shut me down to the things of God. There's much more that I could say about this. But I believe God wants to set some people completely free this morning of fear. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 1 says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, 
of craven and cringing and fawning fear. He didn't give us that. But He has given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. The thing is this. If I don't deal with the spirit of fear in my life, then I will be hindered and limited in the power of God that I'll move in. I'll be hindered and limited in how I can move in the love of God. And I'll be hindered with the measure of peace of mind that I'll move in. Come on, Lord. Who wants to be set free this morning? I got four areas, four specific areas that I'm going to ask people to come up for to begin with. God spoke to me Friday night in bed. And he told me that there are some people here that have been bound and shackled, shackled by fear. When it comes to dealing with fear, guess what arises when you go to deal with it? Fear. <laughs> so to deal with fear, you have to come the fear of dealing with fear. So let me pray for you first before I get you to respond. <clears throat> Father, I just thank you that you haven't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and of sound mind. And I just take authority right now as an elder in this city, I take authority over the spirit of fear in this place, and I command it to go in the name of Jesus. I command to it to release its hold on the lives of people sitting here right now in Jesus' name. Fear, leave in Jesus' name. There are those people here that have a fear of history repeating itself. And that either means something of your past, you're worried is going to come up again. You've got a fear of that happening again. If that's you, I want you to come up the front. The other thing with that fear is that it may be a fear of something that happened to your mum or your dad, you're worried is going to happen to you. I specifically heard breast cancer. That your grandma had breast cancer, that your mother had breast cancer and you were concerned and fearful that it was going to happen to you. The second one was those who fear death. You know, as Christians, we're not to fear death. As believers, we're not to fear death. It's not something that we should be afraid of. But sometimes, there's a fear of uncertainty about death, what it looks like. And maybe it's been something that's passed on to us. Maybe our mum or dad was afraid of death and we've had some bad experiences with things. If that's you, come up the front. The third one is those who fear being alone. That might be those who fear being alone just, just on their own or those who fear they're going to be alone. If that's you, come up the front.
the last one I felt was those who have a fear of man. Now, I don't mean I don't mean you get nervous or you get shy in front of people and you want that gone. I'm not talking about that. We can do that later. I'm talking about the fear of man. It actually stops you from doing things that you feel you should do or you could do. Things you feel you, you know, I could do that, but no, no, I'm too scared. I'm, <sighs> it's debilitating. May even be going to the shops. You're afraid to go to certain shops because you have a fear of man. If that's you, respond. issue with any other fear that I haven't mentioned I don't want you to be left out or miss your opportunity right now because there's an opportunity God is wanting to do can I just say a number of people during worship spoke to me and said I feel God is going to break something off this morning before the service in my prayer time this morning I said I just felt God say there's going to be deliverance this morning there's going to be a deliverance, a breaking off. Sometimes there's moments in time where God says, today is the day where there's going to be a breakthrough for that. That enough is enough. Why? Because there's a battle going on that God says, I want you to be fully equipped and in the position to release what I've given you so that you don't have to hide in the bunker anymore. Why? Because there's people that need you to be free. There's people that you need to reach. In your freedom, there's people that you need to go and gather and bring into the community of God. See, our freedom is not just for our own freedom. He says, I set you free that you will set others free. Holy Spirit, just begin to minister. Where it says, with the Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. There is freedom. You were the of it all. The ministry you team. Were the of it all. Those in the ministry team, won't you come up? I'm going to start to minister to these guys. From you are all things, to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Just before we go on, just before we go on, there's one thing. Just with your eyes closed, there's something that God is saying we need to do. We need to cancel the agreement we made with fear where we've made an agreement with fear we need to cancel that we need to say you know I cancel the agreement with fear to do with this issue I cancel the agreement to do with fear because of this person or because of what happened here I no longer agree with fear I cancel it I sever it I cut it off in Jesus name I break off the fear in Jesus' name. Some of you are afraid to do that. Some of you are afraid to cancel and break it off. Cancel it. 
cancel that agreement. Cancel that agreement. Cancel it. The Lord didn't give you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. Power, of love, and of sound mind. Power, love, and sound mind. Power, love, and sound mind. Power, love, and sound mind. Clarity of mind, peace of mind. Lord, break off that fear in Jesus' name. Break off that fear in Jesus' name. Break it off in Jesus' name. Break it off. 